trying to get rid of Hello, it's Landon Degati, a member of Long Island Cares and founder of Food Secure Future, a place for people of all ages and backgrounds to share ideas and learn about the most pressing food security issues. I'm here today with a special guest, Dr. Lois Frank, who has too many accomplishments to list, but to name a few. She received her PhD from the University of New Mexico in culinary anthropology. She spent over 30 years documenting foods and life ways of Native American tribes from the Southwest. She's the author of the James Beard award-winning book titled Foods of the Southwest Indian Nations. Dr. Frank has been a culinary, amb culinary ambassador diplomat with the U.S. State Department and Office of Cultural Affairs, traveling internationally to teach about the history of Native American foods. Hello, Dr. Frank, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So today I'd like to discuss the role of indigenous traditions as a model for food security and sustainability. So with that being said, my first question for you today is, how have indigenous traditions and practices historically contributed to food security within their communities and ecosystems? Okay, so um, before we jump into that, I wanna just contextualize and do some uh, definitions and uh, talk about uh, food sovereignty. Um, so food sovereignty is a Western ideologic word and, and foundation. Um, when we think of food sovereignty, if I were to simplify it, it would mean the right, not the privilege, the right to sufficient, healthy, culturally appropriate food. So with that said, then we have to look at what is a Native American sort of ideological view of food sovereignty? And I work with Chef Walter Whitewater, who's from the Navajo Nation. We have a small catering company in Santa Fe, New Mexico, um, called Red Mesa Cuisine. So I'm talking to all of you from Santa Fe. And uh, Walter doesn't like to use the term food sovereignty, it really bothers him. And there are some other Native American scholars and uh, Native American educators that feel the same way. Um, because I uh, was or am in academia, uh, it doesn't bother me as much. I understand the term and I understand the foundation of the term. But uh, when Walter defines this, he, he changes what this means. And uh, I just want to go over that with all of you and your, your listeners and viewers, because I think it's important to contextualize it. So what is Native American food sovereignty? Um, it's a form of food justice. It's food security. What is food security? Feeling like you know where your next meal is going to come from. A lot of people don't know where their next meal is coming from. And that's very unsettling. It's very scary. Uh, environmental justice. In order to grow food, you need a clean environment. If the environment's toxic. So this is also woven into this whole concept. Uh, and it's dependent on something called TEK. And when I teach my indigenous food class at the Institute of American Indian Arts, I tell my students that TEK, uh, and every culture in the world has this. And I think we all should, should co contextualize that everybody is an earth person. Everybody is indigenous to somewhere and they're indigenous to the earth. And so we are all obligated to be stewards. There's no one culture group has to be a steward and everybody else can rape and pillage. Everyone must work together on this. And so what is... Uh, that would bring up what is TEK, but let's finish the concept of Native American food sovereignty. So uh, the idea of this is that Native communities can produce and grow and harvest their own food and buy these foods from other Native vendors and growers. So that means that there has to be Native American growers and vendors to be able to buy from. Uh, trading and bartering has always been a big part of this. And then this reconnects Native people and Native communities to the land, uh, to their community, and to their culture. So 
Native American food sovereignty is a little bit different than the actual Euro European definition, okay? So I think that's important. And then when we look at TEK, uh, which is traditional ecological knowledge, so every culture in the world, regardless of where it is, has a form of this. And it's based on the environment. It's based on knowing the foods where you live. So uh, we could use you as an example. Where where are you living right now? Uh, I live on Long Island. Long Island. Right. And so Long Island, uh, when the glacier came through, uh, is very fertile soil. Uh, it's got great soil for growing. So before there were... Um, developments and, and Long Island used to be very rural. They grew potatoes. They have some of the best tomatoes in the world. And so the people, lots of seafood, uh, which is important. Uh, New York itself was an area up until the mid 1800s where there were so many oysters because the native people used those. It was amazing, right? And then they got over harvested. So this all factors in. So the people that lived on Long Island knew all the foods, the season. When do you plant? When do you harvest? How do you hunt? How do you fish? So the same thing is true for Native communities all over, um, all over the world, actually. But we'll focus on the Americas. So the idea is that you perpetuate the wisdom of the ancestors that is handed down through generations through songs, stories, beliefs, recipes, uh, et cetera, and that this becomes part of the physical, mental, emotional, uh, and spiritual wellness. And TEK is how information on how to hunt, how to harvest, when to hunt, where to hunt is passed down on a region. I right now I'm living in Santa Fe, New Mexico, way different than Long Island. So the TEK surrounding this area is much different than the TEK surrounding that on Long Island. So does that help just contextualize that? So now let's go back. Why don't you repeat the question again, since now everybody's educated on some of these terms, and then we'll address that. Does that sound yeah. okay? Yeah, okay. Thank you for providing context and background. So how have indigenous traditions and practices historically contributed to food security within their communities and ecosystems. Okay, so we've started through contextualizing this, TEK, so Native people were able to pass down, uh, when is when are you supposed to harvest oysters on the East Coast, right? There are certain times you're not allowed to, certain times you are. So all of this knowledge made the systems secure so that it was guaranteed food and that that food was safe to eat. Uh, you know, a, another sort of native ideological approach to food is you only take what you need. Many cultures, many native cultures uh, talk to the plant or the animal. Uh, offerings are made um, differently. Each tribe has its own way of sort of doing this. And um, then you take only what you need. You never take more than you need. And two reasons for that. One, you want the animal or plant to be able to repropagate or sustain itself. Uh, and two, you want to share so that there's enough for not only human consumption, but animal consumption uh, because the ecosystem is integrally tied. I always do... Uh, I like to do the bicycle wheel. I like to use the bicycle wheel as an analogy. So uh, we can take a specific area and that's the center, right? That's the food sovereignty or the ecosystem. And then all those little spokes on the bicycle wheel are all the different components that are used to complete that circle so that the circle is sustainable. So in native uh, ideological approaches to things, everything's connected. You can't kill all the beavers and expect the rivers to be healthy. You can't cut down all the trees and expect there to be a good forest uh, to provide food for deer and animals that live in the forest. And you can't 
overfish or overharvest the oceans or the oysters in New York, which they did do because they virtually disappear. So it really is about a sustainable approach, using what you need, leaving some for future generations, leaving some for other animals and sharing uh, this idea that everything is connected and whatever you do affects everything else. Yeah, thank you for that response. So how do you think you could use that information and integrate it with modern agricultural practices to enhance food security on a broader scale? Well, uh, a good way to do that would be to look at an ecosystem or an environment. Uh, I'll use the Southwest. So for instance, here, um, it's very dry. And so what are the best crops to plant in an arid environment? On the East Coast, corn, uh, which is also grown on Long Island, uh, is uh, usually mounded because you guys have a lot of water, right? So we want the water to come down that corn plant and mound off. Here, we're very dry. So you want a waffle. So if you think of a waffle and you think of that concave, right? We want to gather the water so the water can build up and nurture that plant. And that can be done with a, a form of dry farming, uh, which is used in arid areas so that crops can uh, survive and flourish. And the other thing is that a lot of the plants have evolved or adapted, for a better term, to their environment. For instance, the Pueblo blue corn in this area has elongated roots, and those roots go down up to 18 to 24 inches where there's water. Roots uh, in some of the East Coast tribes, uh, where there is a lot of water, are very shallow because there's water on the surface. So the plants have adapted to their environment. And then you need to decide which plants are appropriate. When do you plant them? Uh, corn, beans, and squash, very, very, very important in Native American agriculture. They grow really well together, and they grow really well together. A lot of uh, people consider them to be a family and families like to remain together, just like us. So corn needs nitrogen from the soil. Beans give nitrogen to the soil. Beans need a pole to climb up. Corn is the perfect pole. And squash has big leaves, which shades the ground, keeping water in and weed growth out, right? If weeds don't have any sun, they can't grow. And so together, they're completely sustainable as this family unit uh, called by many East Coast tribes of uh, the three sisters. And it's not only how they grow, but also the nutrients that they provide. So corn lacks a couple of amino acids. Beans have every amino acid corn doesn't have. Beans don't have all the amino acids either. And every amino acid that corn doesn't have, a bean doesn't have, corn has. So together they form this complete amino acid protein. And then squash has lots of fiber, lots of water, lots of vitamins. And together they have uh, almost every nutrient known to sustain human life. So eating them and learning how to grow them and growing them in a very sustainable way is a wonderful way to move forward on keeping food accessible and making sure that there's enough uh, for future generations. So I think that's a really important concept. And uh, I'm gonna introduce something else, another definition that I really like. And this uh, is a definition that I learned from uh, Dr. Melissa Nelson, who's a professor at uh, Arizona State University. And she started a nonprofit called the Cultural Conservancy. And it's called an indigenous partnership. And in order for things to sustain, right? So let's say I live along the river and me and my community are really working hard to keep the river pure and clean. We don't use pesticides. We use organic. 
Uh, we're really good stewards. We make sure that there's native plants on the river. But the people to the north of me and the people to the south of me on the river are polluting. Am I making a difference? Not enough. So what we need to do is form these alliances, these partnerships, and there's room for everybody to participate, which is the beautiful thing because then it becomes all inclusive. Every earth person, every person on this planet can play an active role in making sure that there's food, food security, food sovereignty, traditional ecological knowledge for future generations to come. So uh, how do we do this? Well, what is an indigenous partnership? So an indigenous partnership is a short and long-term reciprocal alliance between indigenous groups, Native American tribes, communities, organizations, and other ethnic or Euro-American groups organizations, institutions, and individuals, but here's the key, where the indigenous agenda takes priority. So let's uh, see what would be the ingredients for that. Well, number one, you need to listen to each other, right? What does the community want? How do they want to work together? And then everybody can say, oh, okay, how can we fit into that, right? What is the community we're addressing that? Self-knowledge, realizing that every partner is rooted in their own ethnic background, uh, cultural identity, and useful position. And that allows for people to have differing views and different levels of knowledge. All knowledge is important in these partnerships. Uh, positions of power right? Some people have been uh, farmers for their whole life. Some people have been initiated into a medicine way of being. Some people are academics. Some people are students. So everybody has a position, right? And that position is an important position. Uh, respect. I need to respect you and you need to respect me in this process, in this part of this indigenous partnership for health and wellness for all people. I mean, as we know, type two diabetes and heart disease and obesity is rampant in the United States. The food system has become toxic. The food system has become so laden with salt and sugar and pesticides that people are getting sick. And the only way to prevent those sicknesses is to change. We have to change the system uh, all the time. None of this is easy and quick. You can't just go into a community and say, hi, uh, I have an hour of free time. Let me help you. It, it's years and, and, and commitment, just like getting a degree, right? It took me 11 years to get my PhD. And so that was a big commitment. And so I think working in, in this realm of food, food security and food sovereignty and sustainability is also time. And you have to understand that there are short-term goals, like an action list or a checklist, and long-term goals, changing an ecosystem, uh, reclaiming, revitalizing, re-indigenizing crops and seeds and ways of being, et cetera, et cetera. And then reciprocity. Uh, everybody in this movement, in this system are learners, but they're also teachers. And uh, Chef Walter and I laugh because we've had like five-year-olds come up with some of the best ideas. Uh, and, you know, we're all sitting there scratching our heads and trying to think, think, think how to do it. And they're like, what about this? Or what about that? So realizing everybody has, and listening to that, uh, a really good perspective on how this might work. And then the end is the benefit sharing. Everybody benefits, the earth benefits, animals benefit, plants benefit, we as humans benefit, communities benefit, everybody benefits, future generations benefit. And so this is really, really important in this process. And then, you know, we shift. Uh, we can use the word paradigm or outcome. Uh, you know, when we activate this TEK, um, we change the way people interact with the land and culture, and this informs practice. Uh, we create and embed uh, indigenous links into standards of 
uh, indigenous cuisine. In other words, if people can learn from each other and recover some of these social values, the idea of giving back, the idea of never taking too much, you know, uh, I think the European mentality when immigrants first came to the United States was, wow, look at the abundance. We, there's so much we can take, 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 take. And you can't. I think oysters are a great example of that in New York. New York City was, had so many, but those two are not completely sustainable. And we do see on Long Island, right? Uh, that the oyster beds are being planted and caretaken by the tribes that are working, you know, out on Eastern Long Island. So another way of, of shifting uh, the paradigm or the outcomes is to transition from not only a Western way of looking at things, but also a native way of looking at things. Um, this idea that everything's connected, this idea um, that you can't take, there, the, the, that abundance has a limit, that you need to manage systems, you need to sustain them uh, to make sure that there's enough to go around. Um, and uh, I think this also helps with food and food practice, uh, food presentation. We're changing this methodology, even in a commercial kitchen. You know, the idea of being a chef uh, is Western, right? Um, and so how do we take that and use that uh, in a very sustainable way? Um, teaching, how do we use teaching methods? You know, there is a classroom, right? You're, you're a student, right? Um, so there's a system of, you know, a classroom situation, but what are some other teaching methods? What about going out and harvesting? What about digging in the ground and planting a three sisters garden? Um, I think those are essential life skills and that when we can shift the system from only reading and writing and reading and writing and reading and writing or, or, or you know, re, uh, repeating like a parrot what we've read or learned that this experiential knowledge, touching, feeling, tasting is really, really important. It's really vital. Uh, for the younger generation to learn this, especially, you know, when we think of health and wellness. Next week, we are doing a, a training and um, with the New Mexico Department of Health, and everyone's going to cut the food and make the food and then sit down and eat the food. You know, that, how can you learn about food if you can't smell it and touch it and taste it and know what a ripe melon tastes like? Most people are like, well, Green melon or honeydew melon is hard and not that flavorful, but really if it's been ripened or allowed to ripen, uh, oh, so delicious, right? Mm -hmm. Or the, 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 the juices from a, a ripened locally grown watermelon or a piece of Long Island corn or a tomato that's grown, you know, so all areas have these wonderful plants and, and I think it's important. And then what happens from this is everything strengthened. Uh, all these partnerships are community partnerships are strengthened. And that is on a very local level. Uh, it's on a tribal level. It's on a state level, but it's also on a federal level. You know, we have to uh, work with people to change policy, right? How one of the things we're working with here uh, through the New Mexico Department of Health and the PED or the Public Education Department is how do we get the small farm? So let's say I have an aunt and she's got a hundred apricot trees. And I want aunt, my aunt Lola, for instance, to sell those apricots to the local schools so that people get local food. But then aunt Lola also gets uh, an income, an economic sustainability. Uh, she has to become vetted or uh, certified. And usually it used to be that only big, large corporations and companies could do this. So how do we get it so that the aunties and the small farms can get vetted or certified so they can also sell? And that's been a big initiative here in New Mexico because those are vital. And as soon as they're approved that those hundred trees, we don't know how many they're gonna produce each year, but those apricots can get sold into the schools at the senior centers. Uh, at local farm stands, et cetera, et cetera. So we're really working hard on that policy level to be able to 
to change that. And then, um, you know, uh, everybody benefits. We identify these sources um, for safe, fresh, and healthy foods. And uh, my students always say, if I live across the street from a great high-end supermarket, but I can't afford to shop there, is that access? No, the answer to that is no, it's not access. So how do we make it so that everybody has access? Uh, and that's that's a challenge. These are things that we're working very hard on and that I really hope to see uh, change in the future. And, you know, young people like you, uh, we're going to pass the baton and it's going to be your obligation to carry the sword and carry the torch and make sure that all of these systems and changing systems get implemented for future generations so that your kids and their kids and their kids have food and the food is healthy and safe and uh, we don't get sick. I think that that's uh, really important. Yeah. All right. Thank you. That's it for me. Okay. Uh, I just want to say one last thing uh, to everybody out there or, or people that might be um, sort of tuning in. You know, the one thing that we want to keep in mind is that, um, and I work with a lot of doctors and nurse practitioners, community health representatives, et cetera. And one of the things that they said is that they no longer use the word pharmacy with a PH. They use the word pharmacy with an F, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, and that all the nutrients and all the vitamins and all the minerals and all the things we needed, all of our medicines traditionally in the past came from our food. And so how do we re introduce this concept, re-indigenize, revitalize these foods so that they are our medicine cabinet, our pharmacy for health and wellness. And I think a lot of the terms and things that you uh, talked about are um, moving in that direction and uh, working towards this idea um, of making food healthy and well for all humans, all earth people, so that we can live a good life and be healthy and have access to uh, food that is truly our medicine. So great note to end it off on. <laughs>